This video is about two of the common measures of association used in epidemiology, which are risk and risk ratio. Let's have an overview first of what risk is. Risk is the probability that an event will occur. It may be that an individual will become ill or die within a stated period of time or age. Or, it's the proportion of initially disease-free individuals who develop a disease over a defined period of observation. Let's have an example. Suppose that in May 9, 2019, a population of 20,000 were reported to be disease-free residents. A year after, that is from May 10 to May 9, 2020, 100 new cases of malaria were reported. This shows that out of the 20,000 who are disease-free individuals, 100 of them develop the disease over one year. So it means that the risk is 100 over 20,000 or 0 0.005. This shows that the probability of developing malaria over one year is 0 0.005. Or in other words, for every 1,000 population, 5 are at risk of developing malaria in one year. Now, what is risk ratio? Risk ratio is simply the ratio of two risks. It's also called as the relative risk. These are used in prospective studies. These figures shows that suppose you have a cohort or meaning a group of people who you are going to observe on a specific period of time, you're going to observe them on a specific period of time. Some of them will be exposed and some of them will not. After a certain period of time, how many of these exposed individuals have the disease and how many of them did not develop the disease? And among those people who are not exposed, how many of them developed the disease and how many of them did not? This shows that you may construct a 2 by 2 table regarding how many of them develop a disease or not and how many of them are exposed. So this part here, let's say A, are those with disease and exposed. This part here, those are the people who are not deceased but are exposed. This part here are those individuals who have the disease but they are not exposed. And this part here are those individuals who did not have the disease and they are not exposed. So given this figure now, risk ratio involves two risk. The probability of getting a disease when you are exposed and the probability of getting a disease when you are not exposed, which may be written in this form. So the probability of developing a disease when exposed and the probability of developing a disease when not exposed. Recall that in probability, the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B or intersection of A and B all over the probability of B. So applying this to measure the relative risk, since the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B over the probability of B, then this part on the numerator is 1 may be written as the probability of developing a disease and exposed, it's just like this, over the probability of being exposed. All over this part, the denominator, the probability of developing a disease and not exposed over the probability of not being exposed. Now, using this table, these values of A, B, C, and D 
may be used to substitute these four values here. This part, the probability of developing a disease, and exposed, that refers to A. So that is A over, since that is probability, the total here. A plus B plus C plus D. All over, the probability of being exposed, that refers to the total of those who are exposed, which is A plus B. So that's A plus B over the total, A plus B plus C plus D. All over this one, the probability of developing a disease and not exposed, that refers to this one. C. So, C over, since that's probability, we have to divide by the total. All over, the probability of not being exposed. That refers to C D. So, simplifying this, all we have to do is to cancel all this denominator here. So what we'll end up with will just be A over A plus B all over C over C plus D. Now let's have an example. Example number one is taken from the idea from a research published by Yang et al. Suppose that a similar study was conducted in 100 men with human papillomavirus and 200 with no human papillomavirus. At the beginning of the study, none of them have prostate cancer. But in 20 years, 75 of them develop prostate cancer. Calculate the relative risk of developing prostate cancer among those with and without HPV. So based on the figure a while ago, suppose that you have a cohort here. Some of them will be exposed, in that case HPV. And some of them will not be exposed, those without HPV. Eventually, how many of them will develop a disease? In this case, prostate cancer. And some of them will not develop the disease. So in this case, how many are exposed? We have 100. And how many are not exposed? We have 200. How many of this 100 develop the disease? And how many of this 200 develop the same disease? In a span of 20 years. So suppose that, among the 135 of them develop the disease, and among the 240 develop the disease. So this will be your A, this will be your B, this will be your C, and this will be your D. Using this formula, which we derived a while ago, the relative risk will be 1.75. Now, how do we interpret 1.75? Remember that the numerator here is the risk of developing a disease when exposed. In other words, 0.35 is the probability of developing prostate cancer among men with HPV. While 0.20 here is the probability of developing prostate cancer among men without HPV. Now, 0.35 relative to 0.20 is 0.15 higher, meaning 0.35 minus 0.20, that's 0.15. And relative to 0.20, that is 75%. So this tells us that the risk of developing prostate cancer among men with HPV is 75% higher as compared to men without HPV. Okay, so remember that this 75% higher is computed by 0.15 divided by 
or simply what you may just do is subtract this by 1. Okay, 1.75 minus 1 is just 75%. So that's 75% higher. Another way to interpret this is that the risk of developing prostate cancer 20 years is 1.75 times more likely to happen with men with HPV than men without HPV. So note that when we use higher, you already subtracted it by 1. When you use the word times, you use the actual risk ratio or relative risk. You may go to this website, which is medcalc.org. So medcalc.org slash calc slash relative underscore risk dot php. And you will be asked for the four values on the table. So we have 35, 65, 40, and 160. Then once you click test, you will be given the value of the relative risk. Let's have another example. Suppose that another study was done to determine if using contraceptive pills decreases the transmission of sexually transmitted infections. A total of 120 women using contraceptive pills and 80 women who were not using were the participants. The development of the sexually transmitted infections is observed in one month. Calculate the relative risk of developing STI among women who use contraceptive pills. So to illustrate, you have a group of women. Some of them are exposed, some of them are not. Or in other words, some of them use contraceptive pills while some did not. After one month, how many of them developed the disease? How many of them did not? And among those women who did not use contraceptive pills, how many developed STI and how many did not? So suppose that these are the values. So 120 used the contraceptive pills and 80 did not use the contraceptive pills. Among those 120, 6 were infected while among the 80 who did not use contraceptive pills, 16 of them were infected. So let's calculate the relative risk. So this will be your A, this will be your B, this will be your C, and D. So A here will be 6, A plus B will be 120, C will be 16, and C plus D will be 80. Substituting those values, we have 0.25. Now, what does that 0.25 tell us? 0 0.05 here represents the probability of being infected when using contraceptive pills, while 0.20 is the probability of being infected when not using the contraceptive pills. Now, if you're going to get the difference of 0 0.05 and 0 0.20, you'll have 0.15. And relative to 0 0.20, 0 0.15 is 0.75. This tells us that the risk of being infected when using contraceptive pills is 75% less as compared to not using the contraceptive pills. So the risk of STI transmission is 75% lower among women using contraceptive pills compared with women not using contraceptive pills. So again, how do we get this 75% lower? All you have to do is subtract this by 1, and that is negative 0.75. So that is 75% lower because that's negative. So all you have to do is to subtract the relative risk by 1. If it's positive, then it's the percentage higher. If it's negative, then it's the percentage lower. You may again proceed with this website and put those values and you're going to have the same relative risk that we computed. Now, what is the connection of this 
in the statistical test which is the z-test for two proportions. Or if you know that the chi-square test for 2 by 2 table is analogous to the z-test of two proportions, now, what is the relationship of the risk ratio and these tests? Under the null hypothesis, it assumes that the prevalence or the proportions are equal. So since risks are also proportions, then you may interpret under the null hypothesis that the risks are equal. Now, given that relative risk is a ratio of two proportions, the null hypothesis assumes that these two are equal since they have a difference of zero. And if two proportions are equal, then their ratio is equal to one. Let's say you have risk on the first group as pi one. And you have another risk on the second group as pi 2. Taking its difference as 0, this is what this says. Now, if these two are equal, then the ratio of this is 1. So in other words, the null hypothesis here assumes that aside from a difference of 0, it assumes that the ratio is 1. On the other hand, the alternative hypothesis assumes that this is not equal to zero, or there's a significant difference, or that the ratio is not equal to one. So with the null hypothesis of relative risk equal to one and the alternative as not equal to one, remember in statistics class that if a p-value is less than the level of significance, usually 0.05, it rejects the null hypothesis. Okay? So when the p-value is less than 0.05, our claim will be in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Thus, when the p-value is, is less than 0.05, just like the example number 1 here, note that the confidence interval does not include 1. Likewise, the p-value here is less than 0.05, so the confidence interval here does not include 1. In epidemiology, if the relative risk is greater than 1, we say that the exposure is a risk factor in developing a disease. Since the relative risk here is greater than 1, as well as the confidence interval, then we say that HPV is a risk factor in developing prostate cancer. On the other hand, when the relative risk is less than 1, just like in example number 2, it's 0.25 as well as the confidence interval, we say that the exposure is a protective factor. In other words, the exposure here, which is contraceptive pills, is a protective factor in STI transmission. It follows that when the p-value is greater than 0.05, meaning the null hypothesis was not rejected, remember that null hypothesis, the ratio is 1, or in other words, the relative risk is 1. Alternative is that the risk ratio is not equal to 1, or the relative risk is not equal to 1. So this tells us that when the p-value is greater than 0.05, it means that the null hypothesis is not rejected. Expect that the relative risk contains 1. Take a look at this example. So given this figure, the p-value is greater than 0.05. And the confidence interval here includes 1. So this indicates that whatever is the exposure, it's not a factor, it's not a risk factor, it's not a protective factor in developing the disease.